education has to be part of love. Love for humanity and love of God to begin with. Because we are beholden to the tradition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Iqra, read, understand, comprehend, transfer knowledge. And also if you think about our prophetic tradition, likewise it's rooted in education and transmission to make people understand where are we going collectively. Those are the challenges that I see for us today in relations to what we are constructing and what we're doing at Zaytuna College. Zaytuna College is here. It's not perfect. We're not perfect. And over these next 10 years, 10 years from now, we're still not going to be perfect. But we hope and we pray that Allah Ta'ala blesses us to be a far stronger institution than we are today. To be a far more stable institution than we are today. And to be an institution that embodies the finest of human intellectual achievement and character formation. We want to restore uh, and participate in the restoration of this amazing tradition of our, our ummah that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi brought and unleashed all of this intellectual, spiritual energy on the world that gave us so many gifts, so many gifts. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Welcome on behalf of Zaytuna board, founders, faculty, staff, and students. I'm honored to welcome you to this distant but perhaps also intimate evening manning the lighthouse in turbulent times. I'm here at the upper campus of Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California. It is quiet, but inshallah we hope that our campus will open soon so our students and faculty can return. Ola, the opener of hearts, the opener of the heavens and the earth, open our hearts on this blessed occasion. Bless this college, bless the co-founders, bless the faculty, staff, and students, bless our supporters both near and far. We ask you with the most sincerest supplication in this blessed month, the birth of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam to accept our efforts and the sacrifices of all of those who work to make Zaytuna College a success. Ameen. We gather in a time of uncertainty, in a time of pain and suffering caused by this pandemic, and also we witness the effects on people's lives. But amongst all of this is the reality of the prophetic guidance. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, has said that if the hour is established upon one of you and in their hand is a sapling, then let him plant it. This college, Zaytuna College, this is our sapling. Among all the tribulations in these turbulent times, we are blessed to have this historic institution that the Muslim community has built. We are truly grateful for the thousands of people who have supported this college with their prayers and their financial gifts. So today we are here to celebrate what we have planted, to root Islamic scholarship in the soil of America and to continue to nurture it. MashaAllah, we have an exciting program today, and we hope all of you will be inspired. We'll hear from present and past students, from our scholars, and from renowned figures. His Excellence, Prime Minister Imran Khan, Dr. Yusuf Kat Stevens. From, we'll hear from Dr. Thomas Hibbs, the President of University of Dallas, and of course, President Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shaker. They all have come together in these difficult times to ask you to continue to support the future of Muslims in America. So please make your financial gifts now and at any time throughout the program to our college fund. And please know that when you make a gift and you donate to the college that you're really supporting two things. One, 
the education taking place in our classrooms, in our BA and MA program, and two, the public engagement initiatives of Zaytuna, which are aimed at the Muslim community and the broader American community. To make a donation, visit our website at the link below. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, the link is pinned at the top of the comment thread. We will begin the program with an update on Zaytuna College 11 years after the first freshman class arrived on campus. For this, we will hear from Sumaira Akhtar, the Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Planning at Zaytuna College. Please join me in welcoming Sister Sumaira Akhtar. Assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah, um, about 10 years ago, in the fall of 2010, Zaytuna College opened its doors as a liberal arts college. One year later, I moved to California and joined the team of 12 strong staff, 10 faculty, and just under 20 students. Today, Zaytuna has 35 staff, 20 faculty, 70 alumni, and our current student body has about 60 students, MashaAllah. Looking back since those doors opened, together with you, we've witnessed the first building acquisition, the first uh, commencement, and the initial accreditation announcement, which was actually given at a benefit dinner with the accreditors in, in my, um, present. We also saw an evolution from a part-time coordinator of student life to a full-time office of student life with individuals skilled in counseling and experiential learning. Then we kept building and acquiring buildings, a second building, a third building, and then five buildings where I'm standing right now on, the, on a beautiful hilltop in Berkeley. Keeping the focus on restoring the centrality of the knowledge in our Islamic tradition, beyond the bachelor degree program, alhamdulillah, we opened a bookstore, launched a journal, established a center for ethical living and learning, and added a graduate program. Then the doors, alhamdulillah, opened wider, and we welcomed international students. And we're now developing a series of initiatives for more public engagement and community education to our Muslim community. This is a story of institution building. The last decade, we laid the foundation. And now, bismillah, we strive to calibrate, to grow, and to beautify. If you've ever offered us a prayer or donated uh, your time or your finances, inshallah, this is your legacy, all the good in it. Now, we're not perfect, and we're ultimately accountable to Allah. So it's your trust that also holds us accountable, and our Office of Institutional Effectiveness internally, and the Western Association of Schools and Colleges externally holds us accountable. So I'm happy to share today that earlier this year, alhamdulillah, the accrediting body, WASC, reaffirmed our accreditation status for eight more years. Now you can either get six, eight, or 10 years of reaffirmation. And it's usually the 10 years is given to the really well-established institutions, like University of Dallas, whose president is with us today, or Stanford University, or our neighbor, UC Berkeley. Accreditation affords us credibility among our peers in higher education, but we also hope it signals to you a sense of integrity and viability. Specifically, the accreditation standards peer into the clarity of our mission, the integrity of our faculty and our curriculum, the quality of support that we provide our students. The, it peers into the leadership uh, qualities and abilities of our provost and president and board of trustees and our governing um, abilities. It also, of course, peers into our financial viability. Most of all, though, Accreditors are really interested in seeing if the institution has an ability to take themselves to account through a very elaborate self-assessment before they're taken to account by them, the WASC peer reviewers. And imagine this, I'm standing here at an institution that was formerly owned by the Cal, the Cal Lutheran University as part of the Graduate Theological Union. And this year, when we were 
uh, visited by the, the WASP peer review team. The head of that peer review team was the president of California Lutheran University. We're part of this whole academic infrastructure of higher education. And now some of us are actually reviewing other institutions as part of the WASC network. Moving forward, a lot can happen in eight years with our eight years of reaffirmation. And a lot can happen in less than eight months as we've all experienced in 2020. Although we still have much room to grow, WASC believes, and we hope you do too, that we stay the course and forge ahead. When Berkeley received orders, the shelter in place order, we immediately transitioned into remote learning and working, like many of you had. Yeah, alhamdulillah, thanks to many of you, we were able to keep the lights on, retain a strong student body, and we adjusted some of our spending as well. In conclusion, allow me to emphasize this idea of reaffirmation. As believers, we renew our intention often. We renew our shahada when we witness someone else declaring it for their first time. In the Quran, one of the verses, Allah calls upon believers to believe. Much in the same way, we remain grateful for your ongoing support. And we invite you to join WASC in their reaffirmation of your support of Zaytuna College. May God bless you for joining us on this journey. I want to now allow some time to, for you to get to know some of our students. I'm gonna share a few facts about Zaytuna College students and then we'll hear from a few of them. First of all, alhamdulillah, thanks to you, our students have graduated debt-free. This is a major achievement that we don't take lightly and that all of you should be applauded for, mashallah. Second, people ask about gender uh, distribution. And alhamdulillah, for the last 10, 11 years, we've had pretty equal distribution of, of male and female. Third, where do the students go after they graduate? It's a common question. Mashallah, they've gone into a variety of fields. Uh, most, more commonly, we're seeing them go into law, chaplaincy, medicine, teaching, and uh, other areas too. About half of them go to graduate school for sure. Number four, uh, where the, the institutions that they get into, this speaks to the kind of caliber that this education provides. Mashallah, we've had students gone, gone to a number of different universities, and here's a sample of some of them. And lastly, alhamdulillah, we've talked about growth for Zaytuna, and alhamdulillah, this year we've welcomed the largest incoming class of students between both of our master's and bachelor's programs, alhamdulillah. I now want you to actually listen to some of our students because they are primarily the core beneficiaries of our program, but they're also the core beneficiaries of your support. I'm gonna begin with Jenna Sellers. She's a current student, a senior in the class of 2021. And in this video, you'll get a glimpse of what a Zaytuna education pr can provide. And while you're, maybe some of you are even watching this in social media, I want you to pay special attention to how she actually talks about social media culture out there. Then we'll hear from two alumni. The first will be Nabiz Noor from the class of 2017. She's now studying pharmacy at Toro Cal University in California. And she's also led their Muslim Student Association as a first year student. Neda Ahmed in the class of 2019, Mashallah scored in her 97th percentile on the MCAT, the Medical College Admission Test, and is now in her second year at the medical school at the University of Texas in Dallas. Mashallah, I hope you enjoy these videos. My Zaytuna studies helped me in my life primarily to just take a second to stop and think before I speak or I act. And if there's one thing that I can really take away with me when I graduate, inshallah, it's to continue that practice of just thinking, contemplating, reflecting, and having that kind of inner conversation before expressing it outwardly. Especially with social media being very prevalent and everyone has their own microphone, so everyone thinks their opinion is important and is very quick to offer it, whether or not it's asked for. I think whenever something happens in the world that's troubling or confusing, everyone is very quick to just run their thumbs and think that they have the knowledge to everything. And part of the benefit of these platforms is that you do get a very wide variety of responses and of opinions, but oftentimes they are very emotionally charged, they are very guttural responses to something that happens. Someone just 
immediately feels something and just throws it out there regardless of how it's curated or who the audience is there's no real thought process of is there any benefit to what I have to say is there any logic to what I have to say so learning how to speak right in rhetoric class we had to give speeches in logic class we learned how to break down syllogisms in hadith class we learned how to differentiate between different types of reports i think all of those things have really just helped me figure out what it really means to speak and what it means to offer an opinion and just to really make sure that it's sound and that you're speaking for some benefit having our donors, even through these difficult times, continue to support us, whether it's financially, whether it's through prayers, through messages of support, it really does make a difference. And even just the little things like scrolling through Zaytuna's Instagram and seeing people say, I wish I could be a Zaytuna student, you know, you guys are amazing, your students are going to be the next generation of leaders, of scholars, things like that really do go a long way. So. Without any of that, there wouldn't be a Zaytuna. So we are incredibly grateful for everything that they have done for us and continue to do for us. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Nabi Snor, and I'm a graduate of Zaytuna's class of 2017. I am currently a second year pharmacy student at Turo University, and I just wanted to share a little bit about how my education at Zaytuna has helped me in my journey. The very first gift that Zaytuna gave me was in fact a lesson when I had just been accepted into the college. I was having to make a decision between two things at the time and one of the teachers advised me that whatever path I chose, I should aim to be the best in it. I didn't realize at the time, but what he told me was essentially a lesson of Ihsan, to strive to do things with beauty, with excellence, and that we may do so in any place and in any situation. This is a pursuit that I have carried into pharmacy. Another one of the most profound teachings that I took away from Zaytuna is the way in which we view the world, engage with it, and find purpose. Our courses in theology and philosophy serve to ground us in faith and ethics, which are especially important in studying the sciences. Grammar, logic, and rhetoric, which help us to read, write, think, and speak clearly have been immensely beneficial in gaining a deeper insight for myself and offering a different perspective to others. Even though these things are far from what we study in pharmacy, these subjects really shape the way that we process knowledge and communicate effectively. Lastly, they do not oriented me to see the meaning in any endeavor, and it is what allows me to have a unique appreciation for God and his creation, even in pharmacy school. As a student in the healthcare field, I think that a part of that care is also that it be conscious, intentional, and sincere. That when I study, it is for the sake of God, and that when I practice, it is for the benefit of others. I often think back at the mission statement as a true reflection of what Zaytuna does for its students and in all the ways that it has prepared me for where I am today. I am indebted to my teachers, my peers, and our supporters for every gift that they have given. May our contributions continue to light the way. May you have tawfiq in all of your affairs, and may your blessings be ever bountiful. Barakallahu feekum wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Diva Ahmad. I'm a graduate of Zaytuna College and right now I'm in my second year of medical school at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit about how I feel Zaytuna prepared me for medical school. So most people, when they think about Zaytuna, they don't see it as a pre-med program. And that's because you're not studying physics and chemistry and biology. But really, in my opinion, Zaytuna was the best pre-med program I possibly could have had. And this is why I say that. So while you're at Zaytuna, you spend four years immersed in the Islamic tradition and you get the tools for critical thinking and learning by studying uh, logic and rhetoric, grammar, philosophy, metaphysics. And so when you leave those four years, you leave with this worldview or framework that's informed by Islam. And through that, you can um, view through that lens, you can study other knowledge. And so now that I'm in medical school, as I'm studying anatomy and disease processes and treatments, my learning experience isn't just memorizing that information, regurgitating it on a test, and then translating it verbatim into patient care. I think if I hadn't gone to Zaytuna, that probably would have been my experience. But 
Zaytuna really trained me to engage more deeply with what I'm learning. So, you know, I really try to look at what are the foundational principles that are informing modern medical theory. For example, um, how does modern medicine define the human being? How does it define health? How does it define what valid sources of knowledge are? These are things that are very important for us to uh, think about and engage with, but the only way we can do that is if we have our own framework or own worldview. And that's exactly what Zaytuna gives you, which is why I think it was such a phenomenal pre-med program, even for any graduate school, but specifically medicine I'm talking about because that's the program that I pursued. And so that's why I really just wanna encourage students who are thinking they wanna to go to medical school to really consider coming to Zaytuna because it's a lot of work and you study hard, but the fruits are immense. It will really change the whole trajectory of your career and even your life. And it's also very doable. I was able to complete the program and also get all of my prerequisite classes done. Alhamdulillah, I was able to do very, very well on my MCAT. I was accepted into the medical school of my choice. I got all of my research and clinical experience. And if anything, you're an equally strong candidate, if not a stronger candidate than students at other institutions. And everyone at the college wants to see you succeed. So you will get immense support from everyone. They will really help facilitate the process for you. And so I just want to really sincerely encourage you to consider Zaytuna and I just want to take this moment to also truly, truly express my sincere gratitude to the college, to the founders, the teachers, the staff, the supporters. You really gave me something that is so invaluable and beautiful, and I'm really very grateful for it. And my prayers and du'as will always be with Zaytuna, with the founders, with all of you. Jazakallahu khairan. Alhamdulillah. So you've heard the student experience and what our students are receiving from a Zaytuna education. But we also want to give you a broader view of the liberal arts education and teaching the great books, both in the Islamic and Western canon. It's relevant and, what is, and how that is relevant to our current world. What does it have to do with climate change, economic justice, social justice, and the impacts of technology? To help us with those questions, it is now my pleasure to honor, it is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Imam Zaid Shakir. Many of you may not know this, but I've known Imam Zaid for over 30 years. And one of the things that I can say about him, which would, I would need the rest of the program to do that. But one of the things that has just remained central to who he is, is his commitment to teaching. I've had Imam Zaid uh, you know, tell me, you know, Dawood, I need to uh, take care of a student right now. And, uh, and I come to find out that, that student is an eighth grade student that he's teaching hadith to over the phone, the, the 40 hadith of Imam Nawi. Or he's meeting students after Fajr in his office to, uh, you know, continue their study of text and, and broaden their understanding, and give depth to their understanding. So we are blessed with all of our faculty and the commitment that they have to our students. And so now, Please welcome me in joining Imam Zaid. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming Imam Zaid Shakir. Bismillah rahman rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salat wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I would like to welcome everyone to this program. It's a great honor and pleasure uh, to be sharing this uh, virtual platform with you. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank all of our donors and supporters. We'd like to thank the faculty, student, and staff uh, of the college for the, the hard work they've done, uh, especially over the course of the last uh, 10 months or so, adjusting uh, to, or, or the last eight, eight months or so, adjusting to the realities of our COVID-19 world. Uh, I also would like to say that I'm, I'm truly honored to, uh, to know the three wonderful students, uh, young ladies who, who addressed you just before myself. It's such a great pleasure and honor uh, to be associated with students of their caliber. And this is one of the uh, great things about Zaytuna. Uh, we really have uh, wonderful students and a wonderful faculty. 
uh, education and action, by definition, education has to be in action, uh, especially in Islam. Islam, the word is a verbal no noun, we say mustar, where uh, the noun uh, is associated with action. So our religion is definitely predicated on knowledge, but that knowledge has to be put into action for our uh, expression and articulation of the religion to be sound. The two Arabic words that are usually associated with education are tarbiyah wa ta'aleem. So we have the Ministry of Education, the usually say wazarat al-tarbiyah wa ta'aleem. The Ministry of, we could say literally training and teaching. And those are verbal nouns, those are words uh, whose meaning is associated with action. And so we endeavor at Zaytuna College and I think uh, uh, elsewhere when folks really understand the nature of education in, the con in an Islamic context to put that, uh, the education, to put it into action. And it goes into action the way that you just saw. It goes into action when we have a, a, a student who has benefited uh, by thinking deeply before she speaks. And I think our world could definitely uh, use more people of that. It goes into action when you have some, someone reflecting on how their time at Zaytuna College prepared them for the phase of life and the phase of education that they are currently in and in the context of medical school and how even though a lot of what was learned at Zaytuna College wasn't directly associated with uh, medicine, it deepens and enriches her study of medicine. That's education in action. And then uh, our dear sister uh, Nabis, who's currently in pharmacy school, just uh, how uh, her experience at, at Zaytuna has enriched her and placed her in a good position to succeed in what we're doing, what she's doing. And as they move on subsequently in their career, they will be even more deeply engaged with the public, with their, their patients, with their students, with the people that they're serving. And so that education will continue to be in action. So we really, uh, we thank them, we thank all of you, and we encourage uh, you to continue to support this initiative. Uh, Zaytuna is the, the little college that can. Uh, we've overcome so many obstacles. We've overcome obstacles that a lot of people didn't think we could overcome. But by the grace of Allah and by the hard work and dedication of our faculty, student, and staff, we're here and we're continuing to, to serve our community and not just our Muslim community, but our wider American community. And even if you look at the global impact of the college, the global community. So may Allah ta'ala bless you all. This is Imam Zayd Shakir on behalf of Zaytuna College. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Thank you Imam Zaid, for that important message. And thank you for all that you have done and continue to do for so many years for Zaytuna College. Imam Zaid will be back in a little while, but for now, we want to take a turn in the program. So far, we've been talking about the core educational program of Zaytuna, the BA program, the master's program, programs for students and alum. And now we're going to talk about the public facing aspect of the college. So Sister Sumera, you heard her mention Z-Cell, the Zaytuna Center for Ethical Living and Learning. Alhamdulillah, by the generous donation of the um, Islamic Food uh, and Islamic Food and Nutrition Council of America, and uh, from one of our families who donated, we were able to establish this center in the hopes of uh, engaging our community around areas of uh, food, so one of the projects that we have done is the permaculture 
the design course. We've had numerous students, over 70 plus students who have attended this course, both domestic and international. And students have gone on to do some very interesting projects after completing this course. Also, we've had this uh, the, uh, the blessing of incorporating an orchard and over 800 square feet of raised beds. And this year we've had a beautiful uh, crop and, and inshallah ta'ala will be a means for our uh, engagement with our broader community, also just in the neighborhood around here as well too. So these are the aspirations that we have also. In recent years, we've launched uh, major initiatives aimed at educating and engaging with not only the Muslim community, but people also in academia and people uh, of other faiths. And we have initiatives planned as well. And to talk about this public facing aspect of Zaytuna College, we are honored and I welcome Dr. Aisha Subhani. Dr. Aisha Subhani has been with Zaytuna College and worked with Sheikh Hamza for a long time. She is a member of the Zaytuna College Board of Trustees and she also leads the Dean Intensive Foundation, which holds the popular Rihla program, which some of you may have attended. And she somehow finds time to serve as a physician in the emergency room all while being a parent to three young children. So now, alhamdulillah, with the blessings of Allah, let us hear from Dr. Aisha Subhani. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. On behalf of the Zaytuna Board of Trustees, I'd like to wish all of you a blessed Rabbi al-Awwal and welcome you to our first virtual fundraiser. At this time, I'd like to share with you with some of our core initiatives and projects that help connect us with the greater community. Our first project is Renovatio, Zaytuna's academic journal, which was launched in 2017, and we are now in its fourth year of publication. We've had over 50 contributors from various faith traditions and backgrounds, and they've included such notables such as Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, Dr. Eva Bran, and Dr. Gary Wills. In fact, Dr. Eva Brand told our president, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, that Renovatio is the only academic journal that she reads cover to cover, and this is high praise from such a distinguished scholar. Along with the print issue, the online edition receives approximately 20,000 unique views each month, and our forthcoming issue, uh, which is the seventh issue, will be released next month, and it is, uh, has a theme that is very timely, Suffering as Surrender. Our next initiative is the Amir Stein Center. The Amir Stein Center uh, was created to really dispel much of the ignorance and misconceptions surrounding Islam and Muslims today. We've produced 16 videos with prominent non-Muslim non scholars and thinkers who have presented a variety of topics. Alhamdulillah, it's had an extraordinary response. We've had over 7 million views worldwide and we have 123,000 subscribers to our online YouTube channel. Our first video with Dr. Gary Wills, What is the Quran, has reached just over 1.6 million views, alhamdulillah. And we are excited to be releasing some new videos in the coming weeks. So if you haven't done so uh, already, please subscribe and share the videos with your family and friends. And last but not least, we have our curriculum series. The curriculum series is really at the heart of what we're trying to do at this college. It aims to publish texts and commentaries that preserve the rich intellectual tradition from the Islamic and Western civilization. In the English portion of our series, we've already had three major publications, the Creed of Imam al-Tahawi, and we hope to be releasing a second edition uh, next year with uh, commentary. Last year, we released The Art of Persuasion, Aristotle's Rhetoric for Everybody with Dr. Scott Kreider, who is a professor of rhetoric and Shakespeare at the University of Dallas. And our newest release, which is entitled An Introduction to Islamic Theology, is by our very own young uh, budding scholar and theologian, Sheikh Faraz Khan. Uh, the text really is a translation and commentary on the Bidaya, which is a foundational Maturidi Afida text. And we think it's a wonderful addition for students of knowledge. Our forthcoming titles include translations and commentaries by our president, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. We have two uh, really uh, cornerstone texts of the Maliki School of Jurisprudence. One is Ibn Asher. Ibn Asher is the helping guide or Murshid al-Muin. And the other is al-Akhtari. We will also like to release al-Jawhara al-Tawheed, which is a, a prominent Aqidah text uh, from the early period. 
In the Arabic language series, we have some wonderful releases that are forthcoming as well. Next month, we hope to send to publication uh, a grammar book that's entitled Badal al-Maruf, which is essentially a commentary on a poem uh, that explains the glue words or the function words in the Arabic language. And we hope that this will be a wonderful uh, support for serious students of, uh, of the Arabic language. And something that's exciting and is also forthcoming is uh, the Matun al zaytuniya And essentially what this is, is a compilation of uh, critical editions of the foundational texts uh, from the early period. And this is something that really has not been done before. It has two volumes. It has uh, the Ulum al-Aliyah, which is essentially is the Islamic tri trivium that includes uh, subjects such as grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And then you have uh, the Ulum al sharia which are the Islamic uh, sciences that include subjects such as Aqidah, Hadith, Usul, and Fiqh, and so forth. And this will be something that really will be a great support uh, for students of knowledge, inshallah. And last but not least, uh, our provost, Dr. Omar Qureshi, is working on a critical edition of Imam al-Ghazali's famous logic text, al mayar al ilm Alhamdulillah, this could, have, could not have been uh, possible without, of course, the grace of God and your generous uh, support through prayers and your contributions. And an offshoot of the curriculum series is something that we are really laying the foundational work for, uh, and that is the K through 12 curriculum series. The K through 12 curriculum series is going to be a, a curriculum series that's designed for our youth because we realize there is a paucity of high level uh, curriculum material for our youth today. And we hope to have a multi-tiered uh, comprehensive program that will teach our youth the foundational sciences in both the Islamic and Western traditions and prepare them for institutions such as Zaytuna College. And so, uh, we really just uh, want to thank you from the bottom of our heart, and we hope that, inshallah, we can work together to fulfill these noble endeavors. So at this time, I have the distinct honor and pleasure to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. He's someone very dear to us, our president, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Thank you. Jazakumal khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Rabbi uh, al-Awwal al-Mubarak and uh, I just thank all of the supporters and those of you who are online with us today. Unfortunately we couldn't do this live but uh, it's a great blessing that we do have this technology nonetheless. Uh, I, I'd like to introduce two people who have shown their support to Zaytuna. Uh, the first one is somebody I've known since 1978, I think. I met, I met him first in Tucson, Arizona. And uh, he's, he's a wonderful person, a great philanthropist. And that's uh, Dr. Yusuf Islam. A lot of people don't know he's a doctor, but he actually has a doctorate from Scotland in music. So uh, Yusuf Islam, or Yusuf Stevens, was first known to the world as Cat Stevens. Uh, he was from very early on, uh, an exemplary singer-songwriter. And after a near-death experience, he embraced Islam. And bega that began a, a spiritual journey that led him to uh, many, many places. So he became Yusuf and changed his focus to education and humanitarian relief efforts. I think a lot of people don't know uh, the immense amount of work that he has done all over the world, uh, including during the Bosnia crisis. So he has a message. Uh, he's received many, many uh, awards for his charitable work. And uh, he still is doing a lot of really creative uh, projects. So we're blessed to uh, have him. He's going to give us a short message. And that will be followed by uh, His Excellency, the Prime Minister of uh, Pakistan, uh, Imran Khan, who contacted Zaytuna earlier this year, actually in Ramadan, uh, his, his office contacted and then there was a meeting that was set up. And that was because there is an educational institution that's being built in Pakistan today. And the, uh, the prime minister actually wanted Zaytuna and our experience in a liberal arts Muslim uh, educational tradition uh, to help them uh, with some of our expertise in, in crafting the type of uh, college that he envisions. So uh, he was, I think, 
uh, in American parlance, he would be the Willie Mays of, uh, of cricket. Um, but he uh, led uh, Pakistan to a world victory in 1992. But he also studied um, in a really good grammar school. And he went on and to Oxford and studied philosophy, politics, and economics. He joined the political scene in 1996 in Pakistan with a vision to inculcate positive change. And eventually became the 22nd and current prime minister of the country. And the prime minister committed to opening uh, this educational institution uh, in, uh, similar to Zaytun or at least along the lines in Pakistan and hopefully we can work together because I think we should support any good effort wherever it is. And I just want to say that the, the support that we've had from the South Asian community, uh, the Pakistani community in particular, but also the Indian community uh, is, has been immense. So I wanted to say mere piare bayo arbahno uh, this message is especially for Muslims in North America. Uh, I would like all of you to support Zatuna College, Sheikh Hamza's Zatuna College. Uh, because I believe that it is imperative that us Muslims, we support knowledge centers. And uh, Zatuna College is, in my opinion, developing into that center which will impart knowledge to Muslims. Uh, I'm also interested uh, in Zatuna College because Al Qadr University, which we are setting up uh, near Jhelum in Pakistan, we hope to collaborate with Zutuna College in the future. And we believe that this will uh, uh, develop Islamic thought. We feel that there is not enough work and research being done on, on Islamic thought, Islamic scholarship, uh, in the life of the Prophet, um, in Sufism, concepts that uh, need to be developed, and uh, knowledge uh, imparted to Muslims because they need to be equipped to deal with the 21st century. And that can only happen if uh, we lay emphasis on um, knowledge and research uh, on, on Islamic subjects. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm very honored to be with you today, sort of virtually, um, to, um, to actually support one of the most important, I think, um, jobs and work areas of the Muslim community, and that is in the field of education. I've been a long-term supporter and uh, admirer of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and his team, colleagues, who worked really, really hard and tirelessly for the um, establishment of Zaytuna College. Uh, you know, for much of their lives, they've been uh, sacrificing their time and their sweat to achieve the noble goal of the institution which of course is connected to the development of trained scholars and knowledgeable Muslims who are able to live and, and function and work and teach in the, the Western environment in which we find ourselves. Um, both Sheikh Yusuf and myself actually kind of became Muslim in 1977. Well, that was a great year, wasn't it? And uh, particularly for us. Um, but also, it was it was the same year that um, there was a conference in Mecca called the First World uh, uh, Muslim Education Conference, and um, that was a historic moment because it was the moment where scholars from all around the world gathered and discussed and deliberated on the challenges of educating Muslims in, in, in the world environment today. Um, and, um, you know, it was that spark, I think, which um, five years after that event, um, after the birth of my first child, Hassana, uh, led me to really think seriously about education. And I realized that it was going to be almost nigh on impossible to live, you know, to grow up as a young Muslim uh, in the kind of environment that we live without 
firm grounding in Islamic knowledge uh, and, and also in the knowledge of, of the secular and, and that which is, um, which is taught to us every day and through, through all mediums, um, which we can't escape. And so I knew too well that this was probably one of the biggest challenges that, that we have. Um, and, um, you know, as, as you look at schools today, you know, the majority of them are just really dealing with the, the basic function of survival, you know, how we're going to economically get a job and, you know, work, work ourselves up and get all the things that we, we, we dream of in this worldly life. And, um, you know, but that kind of veers away very, very sharply from the original, you know, uh, um, brief um, lesson which began our human life, beginning with Adam. Um, and where in that very primal classroom, um, the lesson began with the name of the Creator. You know, there is no education for a Muslim without the Creator. And, 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 to, and to make sure that that is integrated into the curriculum is, is, what, is the struggle um, that we have to meet. So, um, so when Sheikh Hamza and, and I embraced Islam, it was finding this key, this, this knowledge to the universe that made us Muslim, made us see, you know, the universe as we should. Um, believers, you know, in the one and only creator and Lord of this entire thing, you know. So, um, I know how difficult it can be, you know, for, for, for colleges like Zaytuna to continue to deliver the high excellence uh, and standards that they, that they aim for without support. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm one of those who realized that a long time ago. And, and there are a lot of people who have been supporting our schools in London and, and are supporting Zaytuna. And we hope that you're one of them. Um, you know, to, to, to make sure that we leave some kind of uh, imprint on this civilization that we, that we kind of enjoy the freedoms of, but we are not really contributing that much to um, in, our, in our capacity as, you know, Muslims of, of, of the kind of inspiration uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught. Um, and he did teach us the, the dua which we all repeat when we go round and, and other times, but also when we go round the Kaaba, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhab al nar. Oh Allah, grant us what is good in this world and what is good in the hereafter and save us from the torment of the fire. I really hope you'll be able to support and continue to support uh, Zaytuna College and all those who are working for that glorious knowledge which we, which we are inheritors of and which so many people are dying for. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidil Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Alhamdulillah, I have the, the great pleasure and honor of addressing you a second time uh, briefly. And uh, I'm, I'm charged with making the ask. So I'm going to ask you right now, brothers and sisters, what do you wish to leave behind? What do you wish your legacy to be? How do you want to be remembered? What work do you want? any uh, fiscal resources or other forms of wealth to do once you depart this earthly plane? That's the ask. Ask yourself, and I'm asking myself, what do we want to leave behind? And it's, it's my sincere uh, thought that there, there are very few things you can leave behind that are more important than institutes of higher education. Uh, I spoke earlier very briefly about uh, education in action. And our education uh, as Muslims 
it can boil down to, it definitely has to be an action in two directions. One, serving our Lord. So we serve our Lord on the basis of knowledge and serving humanity. And we serve humanity on the basis of knowledge. And Zaytuna College is training young people. You saw three of them who are endeavoring on the basis of knowledge to serve their Lord and to serve humanity. Brothers and sisters, we need your help to continue this mission, to continue this uh, desire to serve. And alhamdulillah, you have never failed to answer the call. You have never failed to reflect on the ask. I want you to reflect on what we asked you initially. What do you do you wish to leave behind? The gift of education is a gift that continues to give. It says Sadaka Jari. Uh, as long as Zaytuna College is here, long after I'm gone, long after Sheikh Hamza is gone, long after Dr. Hatem Bezian, long after Imam da Daoud Yassin, long after Sister Sumaira, who you heard uh, earlier, long after those wonderful ladies that you saw, Sister uh, Jannah when Nida and Nida and Nabis, long after the wonderful young men that you uh, could have seen and hopefully in future broadcasts you will see, long after they're gone, as long as Zaytuna College is here, there will be new Imam Dawoods, there will be new Sheikh Hamzas, there will be other Imam Zays, there will be other Sister Sumeras, there will be other students like Nabis and Nida and Jannah. And they will continue to be earning edger for you, reward for you. Those students will be like your children. They will continue to pray for you. The wealth that you invested in this college will continue to return rewards to you exponentially, not arithmetically. Because when one student learns, that student then goes out and teaches three or four or five. And those, each one of those three, four or five go out and they teach four or five or six and so on and so forth. And all of that reward comes back to you, brothers and sisters. So we encourage you to support our general fund, support our college fund. And so doing, you're directly reporting, reporting uh, supporting rather our faculty students and staff. You're supporting our faculty. You're helping to provide textbooks. You're supporting our SUNA sports program, our publications and community program, campus facilities. Our publications, you saw some uh, examples of them. These are, these are books that are not only produced in an excellent fashion to the highest standards of publication, Renovatio, the Bidaya of uh, that recently was translated by uh, Sheikh Faraz Khan, an earlier work in theology, the Tahawiya that was uh, translated by Sheikh Hamza, and, and many others in law, theology, and grammar, and rhetoric. These books are the tools that will help provide our students with the tools of knowledge. And your help is absolutely essential, brothers and sisters. So please, uh, even as I speak, Make, donate. You can do it online. Uh, you can do it via various uh, <clears throat> uh, means. So please support our effort. Help us to, to, can, to help us to continue the march of this college and leave a meaningful, significant, and powerful legacy. I'll conclude by saying this, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Institutions are the foundation, good institutions, solid institutions are the foundations upon which we challenge and undo the harm of corrupt institutions and corrupt individuals. Good individuals aren't good enough. We need good institutions. And it's our prayer that Zaytuna is an institution good enough for your support. So please help us to continue to improve. As we said initially, I said it in my initial remarks that were recorded. Sister Sumeira mentioned it. We're not perfect, 
but we are an institution that has been recognized by our peers in higher education as worthy of their commendation and their accreditation. So we pray that we're worthy of your support, brothers and sisters. Jazakallah khair. This is Imam Zay Shakir on behalf of Zaytuna College. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum. Uh, I want to uh, remind all of you that these, these are definitely turbulent times. And one of the important things about turbulent times is having guidance. And we use the metaphor of a lighthouse because a lighthouse prevents sailors on stormy seas or in the darkness of the night from hitting the land and uh, losing their way. So we're all on this ship that the Prophet ﷺ described. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have somebody that I know and respect. I first came to know him at uh, Baylor University where he was the dean. Um, he's actually a, a, a very humble, but a brilliant uh, philosopher. He taught uh, for several years at Boston University, a, a, a conservative Catholic college. And then later at, uh, he, he actually studied at Notre Dame and. And now he's become the president of the Catholic uh, first-rate university uh, in Texas, Dallas University. He, uh, University of Dallas, um, and he has degrees from the University of Dallas, but also from Notre Dame. Um, he's a, a, a serious uh, scholar of ethics and philosophy. He's written some very, very interesting books. Uh, I think they're important books. Um, one of the most intriguing ones for me is uh, a book called Shows About Nothing, uh, in which he examines uh, shows about nothing on our popular television. So, but he's also done some, uh, that's actually a very interesting and deep book, but he's done some really interesting work on dialectic and narrative in Aquinas, an interpretation of the Summa Contra Gentilis, which deals with Muslims in that book also. Um, and he's written a really important book on virtue ethics. Um, so we're very honored to have him. He, he was kind at one point to actually write a beautiful article about Zaytuna College um, that moved all of us when we saw it. So I think he is among a, unfortunately, a minority of Catholic intellectuals in the United States that really recognizes the importance of an alliance uh, between these two great Abrahamic face that are rooted in uh, very similar metaphysical traditions, uh, but certainly in the Abrahamic belief of a day of judgment and a creator who will ask us what we did while we tarried here. So I want to uh, welcome him. He's going to give a 15 minute address. And then afterwards, uh, uh, he and I are going to have a conversation about the problem of nihilism and a few other things. So uh, I hand it over to you, Dr. Hibbs, and thank you very much for being with us. President Hamza, thank you. It's a great honor. Uh, what a wonderful program. Uh, a lot of distinguished people, and uh, I, I don't know how I ended up here at the end of this, but maybe we should run the program backwards and build up to the students. They were fabulous ambassadors for your uh, university, and uh, congratulations on your 10 year anniversary on your extension of your accreditation. And again, on the wonderful student ambassadors. Uh, I have been an admirer of Zaytuna College of President Hamza for many years. Uh, he has visited both Baylor University when I was there and he's visited the University of Dallas a number of times. And we have uh, profited from his presence, uh, his leadership and his wisdom. I want to offer a few words to you tonight. I want to begin with some observations about features of our cultural and political life that are not so healthy. And I want to talk in light of those features a little bit about the indispensable importance of liberal arts colleges like Zaytuna, like the University of Dallas, and then end by talking about the importance uh, to echo some remarks that were just made 
by Imam Shakir about the importance of indispensable role of institutions in our public life, in our religious life. So I'm struck, as I think we all are, by a number of features of our contemporary culture. Uh, you know, when uh, surveys have been done over the decades about friendship and the number of very good friends that people have, there's a drop off from the 60s and 70s where most people said they had about three and a half good friends on average. I'm not sure what a half friend does for you, but this is an average. And today, most people register under two, the number of good friends that they have. So the number of friendships in the past 40 to 50 years that most individuals say that they have has been cut in half from about three and a half to well under two. Alongside that, surveys that ask the question, this is a, we go from a decline in friendship to a rise in civic animosity. The, the other survey that I wanna draw your attention to is one that uh, the great NYU social psychologist, John Haidt brought to my attention a couple years ago when he uh, posted uh, on social media, a survey indicating that when Americans have responded to the question, do you hate members of the opposite political party? Uh, in the 1980s, that was at about 15%. About 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, it had registered a steep incline in the percentage of people who said they hated members of the other party. And it now sits at just beneath 50%. That's an astonishing change in our cultural attitudes toward other citizens who disagree with us about political matters. We don't have to go far on social media, open almost any Twitter site, and it doesn't matter what the first tweet is, within about five or six subtweets, people will be arguing about politics and they will be accusing everyone who disagrees with them of being both stupid and evil. Now there may be both people who are not that intelligent and people who are not that well-intentioned, but the idea that our default position in social media is immediately to assume that anyone who disagrees with me is both fatuous and malevolent is a sign, uh, a really unhealthy sign about our political and cultural life. If you combine these two, the decline in significant friendship and an increase in civic hatred with, especially during the pandemic, it's been exacerbated during the pandemic, an increase in loneliness, depression, thoughts of suicide, especially among the young and the elderly. You have a public situation, and one other thing I'd add to that about our public discourse is just not, it's not just that it's nasty, it's that it's remarkably shallow. Uh, if we've learned anything from the presidential debates, no matter which side you're on, we've learned that our public discourse, our political rhetoric, is about as low as it's been in our lifetime. We can't, today, we can't even seem to produce memorable sound bites, let alone engage in political discourse of the Lincoln Douglas style or of the style that say in the late 60s, Martin Luther King Jr. or Robert Kennedy engaged in, in their public speeches. We're in trouble politically and culturally. And we witness a decline of trust in our institutions, all, our, all the branches of government, journalism, all the professions, the businesses, even institutions of higher education and religious institutions. Americans historically have often in times of crisis and religious traditions have especially in times of crisis turned to the renewal of their educational roots, to the renovatio of their roots as your, uh, as your journal has a, a title. Zaytuna College and others like it provide truly holistic formation. Almost every college and university today claims to be forming the whole person. The problem is they don't have any idea what human persons are, 
and they don't have any notions of wholes or unity. So what forming the whole person means at most universities and colleges is a little bit of this, a little bit of that, with no real unity or depth. As a tuna, as your students have already testified tonight, students receive the skills they need to go to law school, medical school, or enter the professions, but they do so through pursuing substantive questions about the purpose and meaning of human life. So as they're learning the skills of written and verbal articulation, as they're learning the skills of critical thinking, they're doing so by focusing on the great texts of the Western and Eastern traditions, the great texts of the Islamic tradition. They're learning to formulate the questions. An educated person, a great Jesuit, Bernard Lonergan once said, is a person who knows how to ask the next relevant question. You are training minds that whatever area of endeavor or profession they go into, they're going to know how to ask the next relevant question. That presupposes often that you know an awful lot, but a mind that is truly educated is never resting in that knowledge. It's always asking, what's next? How does what we learn in one discipline connect to what we learn in another? How does what we are pursuing as parents and as citizens, what does that have to do with what we're doing in our profession or in our religious life? These are the relevant question that Zaytuna College graduates are equipped to ask. You know, both at Baylor University and at the University of Dallas, I'm very proud of the pre-med programs. Our, our pre-med program here at the University of Dallas has for decades had about a, an 85% acceptance rate to medical school, similarly for a law school. But we know and hope that we produce different kinds of doctors and lawyers. At Baylor, I was very happy to work for many years uh, with a Baylor alumnus and former hospital physician and administrator, Bill Nielsen, who came back in semi-retirement to work with students. And he would tell these very highly motivated pre-med students, you need to study philosophy, you need to study literature, you need to study theology. And then he would tell stories about doctors he knew who were as successful as they could possibly be and yet whose lives had hit an impasse where they were actually considering leaving the profession or considering whether they wanted to go on living. They had lives that were extremely successful by every possible metric and yet their lives were empty of purpose. And he would say to these students, not only is your life going to be fuller, but you're going to be a better physician. You're going to be a better administrator if you understand human nature, if you've developed intellectual and moral virtue. The other thing we lack in our culture, and that excellence in the STEM professions and in business will not by themselves prepare us for or correct, is something I mentioned earlier about the decline in civil discourse. We know that civics education has been all but abandoned in high schools across the country, and it is also abandoned in most colleges. We know from surveys that were done by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute over a decade ago that in some cases, the better the college you go to or university in terms of its prestige, the less you know when you graduate about civics. And you often know less as a graduate than you knew when you came in as a freshman. This is an astonishing abandonment of our educational duty in college and at lower levels. One of the problems I would say with our civic discourse is that we suffer from deep historical amnesia. If you test Americans about anything that hasn't happened five minutes ago and that isn't a matter of pop culture, you get blank stares. If we don't know where we've come from, if we don't know the traditions of which we are heirs, we will not understand where we are in the present. The sort of education rooted in the classic text, the classic debates of Islam with Christianity and with Judaism that Zaytuna College offers roots your students in a deep and rich tradition. One of the most important things we can offer to our students when they join our institutions is to give them the idea that we are gonna 
provide them with the beginnings of an education that is so rich and so deep and so beautiful that they could spend the rest of their lives and they would love to spend the rest of their lives trying to master and they would never be able to do it. This is what liberal education is about. It's also an education in being able to disagree in a civil way with those who are on opposite sides of arguments. There's a great passage that my wife and I teach a freshman philosophy, philosophy and the ethical life class here that begins with a careful reading of Plato's Republic, Aristotle's ethics, and then texts from St. Thomas Aquinas. In book two of the Republic, Socrates praises one of his younger colleagues, Glaucon. He praises him for his courage. How does Glaucon show his courage? Glaucon shows courage by willing, by being willing to consider the strength of the argument that he thinks is false. He thinks that justice is intrinsically rewarding. He, in order to test that thesis, he says, I will take on and advocate for the view that justice is not intrinsically desirable. And Socrates praises him for his courage, for his willingness to test his own view against opposing views. This is a very important feature of the kind of education that Zaytuna College students get. The last point I want to make is about institutional diversity. And here I go back to some of the remarks of Imam Shakir. We are, as I mentioned already, deeply skeptical of our institutions. Perhaps at no time in American history has there been such widespread skepticism of our major institutions, of the three branches of government, of journalism, of business, of other professions, of education, and of our religious traditions. The danger for us is, as individuals, that we get caught up in skepticism and cynicism about our institutions. We need to defend not just diversity of individuals, but diversity of institutions. We need to commit to those traditions and build them up where we have our deepest kinship and our deepest alliances. And I think it is important for me as president of a Catholic university to support institutions like Zaytuna in their mission, because American higher education, one of its great riches has been its institutional diversity. Big universities, small community colleges, religious institutions that run the gamut across every potential denomination. Those of us who are connected to these institutions need to dig deep into our resources, financial certainly, but all of our gifts need to be offered to our institutions to help build them up, especially in this time of crisis and in this time of skepticism about institutions. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to address you briefly this evening. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Well, first of all, thank you very much for those uh, thoughtful and uh, important remarks. I think in, in reading uh, your your book uh, shows about nothing. Uh, you you attempt to address. I, I think that rather you address very well the crises of nihilism in popular culture. And what I want to start off one is by uh, looking at the problem of nihilism, uh, which is a human problem. And I'd like to quote and then ask some of your reflections on this uh, from. I don't, are you familiar with Nishitani, Meiji? You, have you read anything no. by him? No. Okay. Sounds He's like a Jap 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 <laughs> he, he, uh, he wrote a book called Overcoming Nihilism. It's actually really worth reading. But uh, anyway, he says, on the one hand, nihilism is a problem that transcends time and space and is rooted in the essence of human being, an existential problem in which the being of the self is revealed to the self itself as something groundless. On the other hand, it is a historical and social phenomenon, an object of the study of history. The phenomenon of nihilism shows that our historical life has lost its ground as objective spirit, that the value system which supports this life has broken down, and that the entirety of social and historical life has loosened itself from its foundations. 
Nihilism is a sign of the collapse of the social order externally and of spiritual decay internally, and as such signifies a time of great upheaval. Viewed in this way, one might say that it is a general phenomenon that occurs from time to time in the course of history. And he was writing in post-war Japan where they had uh, an immense crisis. So I, I'd like just maybe to hear from you about how this translates what I just read and what you wrote about uh, in your book in our current uh, crises. Yes, very, very good. Um, and, and that's a, a, a very succinct analysis. Just so everyone knows, Nihilism as a term comes from a Latin word nihil, which means nothing. And it's typically taken to be a philosophy or a way of life that says that there's no ultimate purpose or meaning, no, uh, no fundamental standard to which we can appeal that enables us to distinguish between true and false, good and evil, even better or worse. And so it, it, is, uh, it can be the result of deep social, political confusion, spiritual emptiness. Obviously, it, when it's taught, particularly to young people, either as a philosophy or through the stories we tell, it can have a coarsening and indeed corrosive effect on the moral imagination of young people. And that's in part what I was worried about in the book, looking at examples from television and film. Uh, and I, I do think that we are in a time where, uh, where nihilism threatens us in lots of ways. I think our, even in our, uh, in our positive quest for justice, we've had a lot of talk since early summer after George Floyd about issues of, of racial injustice and mistreatment by the legal system, by police and by courts and so forth. A, a, and beneath that, uh, in, in its, uh, its deep authenticity is a great hunger for justice. But I think sometimes in our culture, when we talk about rights, when we talk about demands for justice, because we lack a consensus about what it means to be human, about what the foundations of justice are, whether they're in nature or in God, our, our discussions about these matters have an almost hysterical character to them that borders on the irrational and is always in danger of bordering on violence because we, we lack a, a sense of the foundation of purpose. And so we're always, we're always sort of threatened by nihilism, whether we're aware of it or not. The one last thing I'd say about this is the, the first part of that comment from the scholar you were reading uh, uh, is uh, that the, the sense of one's own nothingness in religious traditions, I speak here, uh, especially in the Christian religious tradition, that insight into one's nothingness is a possibility of opening up into seeing one's very existence as a gift of the Creator God. And so, the the the, the in the in the deep religion religious traditions of which we are a part, that sense of nothingness is always part of our sense of ourselves because we are not self-creators, uh, right. because we are not fully autonomous, uh, because we are not sufficient unto ourselves. And so that sense of my own nothingness within the ambit of a rich theology and liturgy and practice of a meaningful religious life, that's, that is actually something that we are urged to have, right? We are urged to have a sense of our own nothingness and that our dignity comes from our being created by God and from our subordinate relationship to God as creator and judge. And so right. the when you when you have the experience of nothingness apart from that theological framework, the risk is always that everything falls apart, right? That then it's just bare meaninglessness. Well, it's interesting. I know you're a scholar of Pascal, and my father said that everybody should read the 72nd Ponce at least once in his life. And, uh, and, and as you're well aware, I mean, that's the one that deals with proportionality and this idea that the human being straddles these two abysses, the abyss of nothingness 
and uh, from, from which he came and the abyss of infinity by whom he came. And, and he argues in there that only God can know both nothing and infinity. We're incapable of that. And it seems to me that nihilism is people that are looking at the nothing and forget about the infinity. And they've, in a sense, turned their back on that. And uh, Frost has a wonderful poem about uh, the people that look out at the sea. Uh, they cannot look out far. They cannot look in deep. But wh whenever, wh whenever was that any anything that prevented them from doing it? And it seems to me that you know, the 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 nihilist is looking instead of looking at the ocean of infinity, he's looking at the the wasteland uh, on the shore. He's he's looking the other way, and and I think um, you know what you've pointed out in this is that our children. And, and Plato reminded us that give me the stories you tell your children and I'll give you your culture, that our children are growing up on a type of, uh, of popular culture that, that is so corrosive. Um, and over time, I can't see how they could not fall into a type of despair uh, that the, 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 uh, the meaninglessness of life that's presented to them constantly uh, that, that that would be the result. And so I'm just, I'm curious how you see in terms of our institutions, these liberal arts institutions, how, how can we be better at doing what, um, I think Compt has an essay on a pyrocalia and uh, uh, Leo Strauss uses that term uh, when he talks about liberal ed education, the idea that vulgarity, which our culture has become very vulgar, and, and, and vulgarity for the Greeks was a pyrocalia. It was inexperience in things beautiful. How do we restore uh, beauty to, our, to a culture that seems to have really lost it? That's a great question. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that one of my uh, favorite things about being with President Hamza is the, the way he weaves uh, long quotations from poetry into all, all that he does. I mean, there's uh, there's there is an eloquence and beauty, and that is one of the ways, right? It's by adults speaking to young people, especially in our educational institutions, uh, but more broadly, in ways that give them an appreciation of the beauty of language. Right? We're using language all the time, and our language has become so coarsened that we don't experience beauty in it. They, um, the German philosopher Wittgenstein uh, has a great line, the limits of my language mark the limits of my world. And what liberal education offers to young people is an expansion of their vocabulary. So they can actually not just impress people at cocktail parties and talk intelligently in meetings, but so that they can actually see the world in a richer way. You can look at something, a painting, a beautiful, uh, a beautiful building, uh, a, a great work of art, and if you don't have the vocabulary to describe what you're experiencing, you are to some extent insensitive to what you're experiencing, or at least you can't experience it on the deepest level. So giving students a vocabulary so that they can more richly perceive and understand and express their own experiences is one of the keys. It's also that vocabulary uh, and the stories and texts that we read in our curricula give students standards, give students a sense of what it would mean to pursue the truth to pursue goodness, to pursue beauty. And at least after they've had that, they will have the grounds in everything else they're experienced for saying something's missing. Nihilism is being unable to say something's missing. There's a great line in Shakespeare's King Lear, this is not the worst so long as we can say this is the worst. The worst would be to experience something that's horrible and not even know that it's horrible. 
Right. Right. So to to give our young people at a minimum the ability to know that something's missing and to be able to start to articulate what that is from the resources that we've given them through our education. The real danger in our culture is that we sense that things are a mess, but we can't really name what's missing. And without an education, especially a deeply spiritual education, you lack the resources to identify what's missing. And you can even begin to lack the sense that something is missing at all. Right. The um, an, another aspect I think of, you know, what you're talking about about language is because our language is is based on the richness of its literature and its poetry, and and there's something in uh, in in rhetoric as you well know uh, called copia, which is this idea of acquiring a fund of expression uh, through deep reading. Um, you mentioned about Robert Kennedy. I think Robert Kennedy is probably the last public politician uh, at you know being out there with the masses, uh, the, the last public politician that could quote Escalies um, to a, a crowd of largely African-American. And I think they would know the reference. And, uh, and I, I just could not imagine uh, Joe Biden or um, Donald Trump quoting Aeschylus, <laughs> and I think, and and that troubles me. So I really feel like you know your your argument that language is where it begins. I think I think it is, and it's a restoration of language. But I'm just wondering, you know, how how can we get better at this? Because for me. I, I think the loss of, of the ability to read uh, is, is really something tragic in our culture. Uh, I know just for a fact in dealing with students and testing them on very difficult sentences that, that because they don't have grammar, they end up getting lost in, in, in difficult sentences and not really being able to, to see what main clauses are. And I think when you, a civilization you know, it, the difference between a civilization and, and Islam and Christianity are founded on books. And, and, and arguably, even the pagan, the great pagan civilizations were founded on books. There is no Socrates or Plato without Homer. And, and so books are always at the root of, of, of a civilization. If we lose the ability to access books, um, through the loss of language, through the impoverishment of vocabulary and these things, I don't see how we can have a rule of law, which is based on, on a deep study of language. Because uh, all uh, reading law is a great uh, book by Scalia, just about the importance of knowing how to read deeply so that, that, that you can ascertain what laws mean. We're, we're having a debate now about textualists and originalists uh, that try to understand what exactly does this mean and, and how do we interpret it? So I, I, I'm still looking for some answers about how we, because I just, uh, Barry Sanders wrote a book that I read years ago called A is for Ox, Why Our Children Are Dying to Read. And, and John Taylor Gatto told me, the, the, uh, the great teacher from New York, um, he told me that he taught in inner cities, uh, he taught in Harlem, and, and he said that it was so difficult to, to, when, they were, when the students were all collectively together because they postured about not wanting to, you know, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't need this, uh, this knowledge. But he said when he got them in private, they were dying to read. They wanted literacy. And, and, and that gets back to all men by nature or human beings desire to know. Any thoughts? Oh, yes, a, a number of thoughts. Uh, you know, I think one of the great gifts for me as a young person when I was a student and undergraduate at the University of Dallas uh, and, and uh, had begun to take my own faith more seriously as a young adult and to take the intellectual formation that I think I was called to is that um, I had teachers here and, and a group of students uh, when we were reading Aquinas, whom I spent most of my time 
reading and writing about, and and also his uh, his sources, not just in the ancient world, but in the Islamic and Jewish world here, uh, there was a, a turn in the group of us who were uh, in a very friendly way sort of competitive about who knew the most about this tradition. When it became not about who knew the most and who had the strongest argument, but who was the better reader of the text. Right. And, and, and teachers who can inspire in students a desire to be great readers. And for me, uh, Hamza, uh, it, it was a, I was not a very good student in high school, but I had two very good English teachers and we read lyric poetry very carefully line by line. And, and although I wasn't that good a student and my motivations were not at the highest level, I learned there without even being able to acknowledge it to myself that I had a brain and that it would be a good thing if I used it and that I might enjoy it. And so giving students the, the appreciation for language, the love of learning, the joy of discovery is very important, I think. Um, you know, I, I do think today that, uh, that liberal education often flourishes very much at the margins because we have we have all but excluded it from many of our major institutions. But you do find in uh, lots of stories about uh, prisoners reading Dostoevsky together and, and coming to a much deeper sense of purpose about their lives, coming to love the discussion of the book and how it matters to them. A few years back at, um, I think it was Mission High in San Francisco, there was a teacher there who organized for immigrants and uh, second generation uh, Im children of immigrants, a Dante reading group on Saturdays. And there were these great stories about how these students were, young people were transformed, not in the class, but outside of the class by the informal reading of a classic text. And it, I think the, the, uh, the, the question in a way is how do we rekindle the hunger right. that right. is natural in the human soul to right. love what is beautiful, to love, uh, to love language and to love conversation. It's partly that, uh, that we're all on these things way too much and students, young people especially are. Uh, but I, I do think that the soul is still moved by beauty and we as adults have abandoned our, uh, our task to introduce young people, to introduce them to lots of things, but certainly among the things we have to introduce them to is a taste for what is actually beautiful and a love of language and conversation uh, and, and a love of the face-to-face -face interaction with other human persons and, and the friendships that grow out of that. Andrew Delbenko, this great scholar at Columbia who writes a lot about higher education has a little book called yeah. College. Uh, and that's beautiful. But one of the points he makes early on in that is that having a common curriculum in the first year or two right. makes it possible after that for every student potentially to be a friend of every other student because right. they have something in common. They have books they've read. They've had professors right. they've, uh, they've had. And so they can draw upon, if, if they don't have that, the likelihood is that you're going to have many fewer friendships and much right. more shallow friendships. I, I think, and that gets right to shows about nothing because uh, that, that Columbia program, which John Erskine started, and the reason that he started that program was the fact that he saw that the elective system of which there was an immense amount of resistance when it was first introduced uh, at Harvard, um, that there he saw that students no longer were speaking to each other, that there were students that were specializing in this and specializing in that, and that troubled him. So he started that core uh, program. Uh, one of the problems today is that core program, which is so incredibly rich, and, and really, despite the fact that a, a, a large part of it is Western, um, it, it was informed by so many different civilizations. Um, as you know, Aquinas was reading 
Avicenna, he was reading Ghazali, he was reading Farabi, he was certainly reading Averroes. Ibn Rushd was a major source for him in understanding Aristotle. He disagreed with him on some things, but people forget that he 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 saw him as 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 certainly Albertus Magnus, his teacher, was a great Averroist, yeah. and so. Uh, we forget that this this is civilization that we we got. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Aristotle says that the reason mathematics developed in Egypt was because they gave the priests leisure time so they could actually think about things. And and this is something that uh, I think we're uh, our leisure time, which was meant to develop our souls and and to refine our hearts. Uh, has been reduced to shows about nothing. So I think a lot of people, uh, in the end, I, you know, I think people, uh, they, you know, they lose this immense opportunity that we have here, this short time that we tarry here. And, and the Quran's first commandment was read, iqra, to read. And I think Islam, uh, like Christianity, developed an incredible civilization of literacy. And that's why I, one of the things that Jacques Barzin in his, uh, in his book, uh, From Dawn to Decadence, he has a chapter about what he called primitivism, you know, the kind of Rousseauian fallacy uh, where people um, look at very primitive life as some kind of an ideal. And, uh, and I, I think that, that to me is a great uh, tragedy because the, the life of the mind the fact that we are unique amongst uh, creation in that we do have minds and we have this ability to grapple with nothing and infinity as concepts, which is something that the God who created our imaginations gave us those imaginations uh, to be able to do that. And that's something so extraordinary. And to squander this incredible opportunity, I just, I feel for our young people because they're given relativism in schools. They're taught doctrines that this really is meaningless. And then they're told, on the other hand, about rights that they never ground in anything. And this is, leads me to my last question to you. I think you make a very powerful argument in, in uh, your book on dialectic that you know, seeking the good, uh, whether it's you know, the moral virtues, the intellectual virtues, seeking the good requires metaphysics. And at Zaytuna, we, we do really try to give our students, you know, an introduction to metaphysics. So I'd really like you to talk about why metaphysics is so fundamental and important to the life of the mind. Yes. Yeah, so in the, in the tradition that we work out of, right. And you're right that uh, Albertus Magnus, Thomas Aquinas's great teacher, was immersed in in the writers from your tradition, and uh, and that uh, Aquinas could not have done his work without that training, and that was a training that saw these texts and commentaries on them as building up, not as standing between us and reality, but as building up insight and vocabulary to be able to discern and apprehend the truth about reality more fully. And in this tradition, the more fully we apprehend it, the more deeply mysterious it becomes. That's yeah. a great paradox of metaphysics as it's understood in the Arabic Islamic tradition and in, uh, in the Christian tradition, at least amongst the best practitioners in those traditions. Uh, Without some sense, I mean, let me talk about this just in, in terms of our experience of people and our lives and then broaden out to something more substantive about metaphysics. Without some sense, and this is often where secular people begin to have quasi-religious thoughts and sometimes begin a quest for religion and conversion, some sense that there are layers, mysteries, coincidences on one level, which might be providence on another, that, that there are things that I'm not apprehending, levels of depth about my relationship with other people, about my own life, 
about good things that I've done, about evil that I have done, without some sense of that depth perspective in our lives, our lives just become flat and meaningless and, uh, and listless, right? And without joy, without energy, without mystery. So when we have the sense that we're on a quest, as, as Walker Percy puts it in one of his books, to be on the quest is to be on to something. The sense that there's something more, right? That, that I can't quite apprehend, but it's, it's nagging at me. It's gnawing at me. It's pulling me. It's drawing me. That sense that there's something more leads ultimately to certain kinds of affirmations about reality as being deeper and richer than my immediate experience allows, but as being revealed to some extent in my immediate experience. And that's the beginning of metaphysics, the, the sense that there is a whole of which I am a part and that my one of my tasks as a human person in this great, vast, mysterious cosmos where I find myself in a, on a tiny speck of matter called planet Earth for an infinitesimally small period of time one of my tasks is to try and understand my place within the whole that's right. metaphysics. that's well, the orientation well, of metaphysics it's interesting that you're saying that because uh in uh, uh nietzsche who was dealing with with the collapse of metaphysics uh in amongst the europeans um he wrote in uh, the collapse of cosmological values that one of the, he, he gives these three different degrees of, of nihilism or nihilism. And, and he says that the second one is a loss of, of, of a holistic view of the universe, that, that, which is exactly to the point that you're making that this, this is where nihilism arises out of. It arises out of this loss. And in the discarded image, I mean, that's one of the things that C.S. Lewis talks about is that the thing he envied most about the pre-moderns is they really had worked it all out and had such a holistic view uh, of, of the world and understood it within that holism. And so getting back to that, being whole again, I mean, it's interesting that healthy comes from whole. You know, the, the word, the root of that word is, is from the same uh, root that we get whole from. To be healthy is to be whole. And it seems that we're so fragmented, uh, which leads me to, to two last points, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about them. Neil Postman uh, wrote a very interesting book, in my estimation, called Amusing Ourselves to Death, uh, a very prescient book, despite the fact that all the signs and symptoms were there at the time. But it, it was really about popular discourse in the age of show business. Uh, you know, how do we overcome the reality television show about nothing that our political discourse has become, one? And the second, for all of these people that are really having a difficult time uh, in isolation. And, and uh, what's interesting about Kierkegaard says that to the ancients, isolation was a great gift. He said the only thing that modern people can think about doing with it is to punish people. Like you put them in prison, they go into isolation. But it was the ancients wanted to, the sunyasi wanted to go off to the mountain. The monk wanted to go off to the cell. The, the, the Muslim wanted to go into khalwa. So the Prophet ﷺ went and isolated himself in, on the Ghar Hira. Um, I know you're an expert on Pascal. You're a very humble man. But Pascal does say that the unhappiness of our species is due to the fact uh, that we're unable to sit alone with ourselves in our rooms. So some advice on the popular discourse in the age of show business, and then how okay. can we better sit alone in our rooms? And we'll close it with that. Yeah, and, and those, those are connected, right? I mean, the inability to uh, sit alone course. <laughs> leads to the need to be constantly on a screen you know, uh, uh, a thought about screens and then a thought about solitude. Um, Matt Crawford, who's a wonderful uh, thinker uh, and um, uh, wrote, a, wrote a book called Shop Class as Soulcraft, and then a book on becoming an individual uh, in the, called The World Outside Your Head. And he talks about life on screens as uh, not just being about entertainment, but also 
giving us the illusion of a frictionless universe, right? Because if I'm always on a screen, I only have to listen to the opinions I want. I only have to watch the shows I want. I only have to look at the images I want. And I only have to see images of myself coming back to me that I approve of. And, and uh, what, what Crawford says is, and he uses a, a, a bit of Freud that's actually sane here, not all Freud is, but that, that in youth, we're, as children, we're dominated by the pleasure principle. I don't think that's quite right. But as adults, it's the reality principle, right? And what you have to do to move from being a child to being an adult is to learn how to navigate the reality principle, the way in which the world and other people push back on my will. Well, right. if Crawford's right, and if time on screen leads us to appreciate and long for a frictionless universe, then we're not going to grow up. We'll be perpetual adolescents, right, who will just like images that reinforce our shallow, self-approving images of ourselves and our friends. So what we need are friends, books, jobs, other things that draw us out of ourselves and enable us to learn how to navigate and respond to the way in which the world pushes back against our will and to see that that's not always just negative, right? Part of education is, is learning to overcome obstacles, to become resilient and courageous as adults. And you don't get that from being amused on screens all the time. The second point is that, I mean, you're right, this, um, this moment in of the pandemic has uh, inflicted upon us isolation that's been very difficult. But it's also offered us, and we've got to think God is trying to teach us something through this pandemic, right? God is trying to get yes. our attention. And yes. I'm certain that one of the things that God is trying to say to us as he gets our attention is be still and know that I am God. Right. Learn how to be still and be empty in the presence of the fullness that is divinity. And uh, and this time is an opportunity, especially for those of us who are believers, to renew our commitment to silence, to renew our commitment to contemplation, which leads, as one of your students said earlier, to the kind of internal reflection that enables us to think and speak and act wisely. The recovery of solitude and of a receptive disposition to nature, to other people, and to God is indispensable for us to think, speak, and act wisely. And that is the ultimate goal of liberal education. Well, beautiful to end on, President Hibbs. I, I really want to thank you on behalf of our college and all of our supporters. Just I hope we can do this again. I really appreciate just your intelligence and your sincerity and 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 also just your your genuine support for our college and what we're trying to do. I think we're kindred um, institutions and you know, God bless you. I want to thank uh, everybody who's been on with us. Um, I hope that you do help us. We do need support. I know Dr. Hibbs uh, raises money for his college. We have to raise money for our college. Uh, you're, you're who enable us to do what we do, and we want to do it better uh, more, and more effectively, and, and we can only do that without your support. So please help us. And in closing, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Imam Daoud to uh, say a, a short, short prayer. So thank all of you. God bless you. Uh, Thank you. Thank our esteemed guests. Um, and we hope that this has been an inspiring event for all of you. Um, and that you have a better understanding and appreciation of what your supplications and your support have built this sapling or planted this sapling of Zaytuna College, and may Allah continue to, to bless it, um, you know, far beyond our time. May it be something as a, as a legacy that is heavy on the scales for all of us who contribute in building this institution, this college on the hill. 
So at this point, if you haven't made a donation or you sent a gift yet to the college, please understand that there are many ways that you can give the gift of knowledge. And I'll mention a few here. One is by a monthly gift by joining our 12,000 Strong campaign. Uh, one, secondly, you can help us in building our and establishing our endowment, increasing our endowment. You can start a student scholarship fund or even aid us in developing our campus by uh, supporting our campus projects. So for more information and ways to give, visit our website at zaytuna.edu. So before we end, I would like to honor, I would like to offer a supplication in closing. So Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Salatu was salamu al Ashraf al Ambiya wa Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kithiran ya rabbil alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you in this blessed time and in this blessed place with these blessed people and these blessed hearts to pour out your love into our hearts, pour out your guidance into our hearts, open for us the doors of mercy and wisdom. O Allah, we ask you to take us by the hand through this journey in taking these students to levels of understanding that will allow them to be better citizens of this world and to aid in the betterment of humanity. O Allah, we ask you to bless the co-founders of this college, the faculty of this college, the students, the staff, the board members of this college, those who donate to this college, those who supplicate for this college, and those who want good for this college. Increase all of them, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to continue to inspire those who give generously to this college. Bless our students for the sacrifices they have made. It is not easy in the conditions that they are studying in. Bless our faculty for the sacrifices that they are making. It is not easy for the conditions in which they are teaching. We ask you this through your most blessed names. You have said in the Quran, وَلِلَّهِ أَسْمَى الْحُسْنَ فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا To Allah, the most beautiful names. Ya Allah, we call upon you by your most beautiful names. We ask you, Ya Allah, to make our ease in those who are afflicted with any type of illness due to this pandemic or any type of malady, any type of illness, spiritual, physical, psychological, mental. Ya Allah, we ask you to bring ease to this affair and make our affairs easy both in this world and the next. We ask you in this blessed month, the month of Rabi al Awal, to bless us and to give us and we ask you for the best of what the Prophet Muhammad has asked you for. And we seek refuge in you for the most evilest things that he وسلم, sought refuge in you from. And Ya Allah, in this blessed time, in this blessed place, in this blessed moment, we ask you to make our best day, our last day when we leave this world and meet you. تعالى عالبدر علينا من ثنية الوداع وجب الشكر علينا ما دعا لله دا Oh the white moon rolls over us from the valley of وداع and we owe it to show gratefulness where the call is to Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
أيها المبعوث فينا جئت بالأمر المطاع جئت شرف المدينة مرحبا يا خير دار أيها المبعوث فينا جئت بالأمر المطاع جئت شرف المدينة مرحبا يا خير دار أيها المبعوث فينا جئت بالأمر المطاع جئت شرفت المدينة مرحبا يا خير دار رسول صلى الله عليه وسلم نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم